Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India On uh, lecture 37, we uh, seriously start our discussion on uh, the scientific elements of FEM. We are not interested on engineering application of a FEM. There are many uh, such specialized courses where you could do that, but we try to find out how the accuracy aspect of FEM is uh, in the course of this, uh, this lecture and the following lectures. <coughs> we notice that uh, the scientific element of FEM is uh, in an effort uh, to reduce the residue, not exactly, but in a weighted manner. And we talk about various variations of this method in terms of boundary and interior methods. We also talk about various versions of weighted residual method. They could be a collocation method or we could apply it uh, at a subdomain or one could actually apply employ a least square approach or one could uh, take the classical bubnov galerkin method. Uh, the bubnov galerkin method is a non-dissipative method and which is uh, quite uh, interesting in its own right. So, we talk about this bubnov galerkin method. Uh, in appearance, this bubnov galerkin method appears to be as if we have separated the variables, but it is indeed not so. We will highlight why it is so. We also identify that the bubnov galerkin method would be a sort of non-dissipative, so it can suffer numerical instability. And uh, in the bubnov galerkin method, we choose the basis function itself as uh, uh, the interpolating functions, which are low order polynomials. But uh, there are other ways of uh, circumventing problems of bubnov galerkin method. Uh, the one of the method is the petrov galerkin method and its versions that we ta talk about here is the streamline upwind petrov galerkin method of huges and the flow control uh, uh, fcbi method of uh, bathe and his colleagues <coughs> we basically um, um, having introduced all this uh, briefly get into the finite element approximation, talk about the various basis functions and we notice uh, that this basis functions could be local or global and with this we will conclude this uh, lecture. And uh, touching upon the last topic, uh, uh, it is on finite element method, but I am not going to cover finite element method the way you will find in many books or in many other courses. I will uh, focus upon the scientific uh, element of it. So, we are going to highlight uh, how FEM is uh, similar or dissimilar with other methods. For example, uh, say uh, we do talk about, we did talk about a lot on uh, finite difference methods throughout this semester. Uh, by and large, finite difference methods are uh, quite uh, good in terms of resolving scales uh, with uh, very high accuracy. <coughs> Uh, one of the disadvantages of the finite difference methods that we have uh, seen is uh, it is little difficult to handle complex geometries. <coughs> okay. uh, on the other hand, if you look at the other uh, methods, those are available. For example, finite element or finite volume method, they are considered attractive because uh, they are able to handle complex geometries and uh, therefore, they can uh, take care of uh, complicated boundary conditions too. <coughs> now, uh, if that is so, we need to really find out if this um, method, finite element and finite volume methods also satisfy those uh, nice properties which uh, FDM gives automatically. I mean, not automatically, you will have to uh, look for it and uh, devise better methods. <coughs> uh, keeping uh, 
our point of view focused on FEM, uh, essential idea, the big picture is that uh, you have a computational domain, you split that computational domain into small subdomains and you try to satisfy uh, this uh, governing equations in these subdomains uh, in a, uh, a piecemeal approach. Okay. <clears throat> And how do you satisfy the governing equation? That is also equally important. You just do not simply uh, just uh, plug it into the governing equation and say, well, it is satisfied. No, uh, there are certain uh, developed methodologies uh, from calculus of variation or uh, uh, what we are going to talk about is a little bit on weighted residual method. So, what we are saying that uh, uh, in FEM, we will assume a form of uh, the solution, which we will call as a trial solution or approximating functions. And then we will plug it into the differential equation and then we will see that the differential equation will uh, not be exactly satisfied. We having done those error analysis, we are quite familiar that even with our best intention, we are left with some errors to handle. Uh, at the equation level, that is what we call as the residue and uh, in FEM, we try to uh, reduce this residue, not exactly it is impossible. So, you uh, do it in some kind of a mathematical sense, which is given by this weighted uh, residual method. So, we will talk about that. <clears throat> One of the things that um, distinguishes uh, FEM and this class of FEM, FVM and FDM versus uh, let us say spectral method is uh, the solution method itself. Okay. Uh, what we saw that uh, we are looking for a solution, uh, then we are actually start off with some kind of approximation. Uh, that is our goal. So, approximate solutions uh, can be actually uh, broadly classified into two uh, uh, distinct uh, categories. One is uh, the global solution, another is a local solution. What do we mean by global solution and what do we mean by local solution? Suppose I have a function uh, f of x and I write it uh, like this. Uh, then uh, what you notice that we are writing the solution in terms of uh, functions. Hmm. Uh, whose space dependence is given by this. This is a kind of an approximation, we are talking about approximation, right. So, this is one set of approximation, where space dependence is given, let us say, by the uh, Fourier uh, series. Now, uh, <coughs> what you then uh, try to do is, you try to find out what this uh, amplitudes of this Fourier series are, by plugging this expression into a differential equation and you get equations for f of k and that is the method. Now, uh, if I get a solution uh, with say j equal to some 1 to n and then I decide to add one more term, hmm? then what happens is, what about this function? If my domain is like this, let us say my domain is like this, it starts off from here and goes on till here. Now, if I keep changing uh, this function here little bit, uh, instead of k j, I change it to say k j plus d k, a small change. Then what will happen is, that effect will be felt all over the domain. So, that is what is a global method is. So, a change in the approximate solution has a global effect across the domain. That is what we mean by global. So, one of the simplest example of this is the spectral method, Fourier spectral method, that is what we wrote here. Now, there are plus points and there are minus points. The plus point is when you apply a global method, then you could take fewer terms, fewer terms and get very accurate solutions. So, for example, if I am trying to solve an equation, differential equation of f and then I may take 16 terms or 20 terms and I find that is going to give me a pretty good solution. So, Global method, one of the strongest point is that you can uh, get by with uh, taking far fewer number of points. That is good. 
but what happens is if you make a change in this uh, global solution components any one of them its effect is also global okay so that that is uh, one of the issue <coughs> in contrast if what you could do is you could uh, keep solving the problem in a local set i could identify a subdomain and develop a method uh, apply it there and then i try to solve it and there if i make some change here the effect is kind of a local effect it is not going to be percolated there in fact uh, having done this uh, finite difference method in such great detail over the semester now you have realized that when we did those explicit spatial discretization they are like a local method whereas the compact schemes which we did they are like global method because they are each and every node were connected by those auxiliary equations that we wrote for those derivatives right so you can see that even uh, talking about in this generalities within each method itself we could uh, distinguish between global and local method okay so that's what uh, we are saying here that in fem <coughs> will uh, decompose the problem into smaller subdomains and try to satisfy governing equations uh, in a weighted uh, by some weighted residual method and one of the um, essential element of fem is this approximate solutions that we are writing uh, they are going to be simpler polynomials here it was like a cosine or sine function which is a global function but in fem i would probably uh, approximate the solution in this and i could probably say look if this is one node and that is another node my local solution behavior would be like this a decomposition of two modes okay uh, this plus that we'll see so this is something if i take say linear uh, basis functions for this fem i would probably do that so that that is what we are saying here that uh, we'll uh, take it as simpler polynomial so i'm just showing the lowest order polynomial that is possible is the linear variation right <coughs> well um, so you see um, this is uh, the sum and substance and fem is a local representation which is uh, distinct from global methods like uh, spectral method now what are these uh, weighted residual methods that you are talking about take a look at uh, equation 1 it is your uh, a generic problem where you probably do some kind of spatial discretizations and you end up with some kind of evolution equation like the one that is given in uh, uh, equation 1 you define it in the domain uh, x in uh, uh, omega and you also define the initial conditions and the boundary conditions as given in 2 and 3 <coughs> now how do you develop this uh, weighted residual method you have to select a trial function which we'll call as u of n uh, u of n will have uh, two parts okay <coughs> the first part uh, relates to uh, a space time dependence of the problem where this uj of x is the uh, specific uh, qualitative dependence uh, that we are going to prescribe that, as i told you like if i look at a domain and if i say my uj of x is like this so this two together i could say that look this this is my uh, uj of x okay so i i prescribe that space dependence there in addition uh, this uh, in equation 4 this last part ub of x2 is put in there that actually helps you in satisfying the boundary condition so what you are trying to do is one part of the trial solution is uh, geared towards uh, satisfying the differential equation another part is geared towards uh, uh, satisfying the boundary condition right <coughs> um well i said that it is geared towards uh, satisfying the differential equation uh, that uh, is not necessarily uh, guaranteed because we are not specifying what this uh, cj of t is so the time dependence is kept as it is uh, we do not know a priori what it is but space dependence we are making some kind of a local guess this is like what we did in our um, explicit method we locally fitted a polynomial right so the that is like fixing your uj of x if i take a second order central difference scheme then basically i am uh, prescribing this uj of x is a kind of a quadratic polynomial okay so
so that that's the way we do however here what you are doing is almost like your separation of variable right uh, there is a space dependence part segregated from the time dependence part however I, I i would not explain it to you right away but please do uh, make note of the following fact that uh, the time dependence part if it is uh, truly time dependent and not space dependent then what this subscript j is doing there this is often uh, not uh, very clearly explained we'll come back to it later but please pay attention to this it is just not simply separation of variable the way we understand if it was a pure separation of variable i would not identify this c of t with individual nodes there is an implicit space dependence also built in there right so this is uh, something we'll come back to it uh, in, in fact i fail to see in most of uh, books on finite elements where this part is highlighted but that is uh, one of the strongest point of fem which uh, people have not uh, uh, sort of uh, really highlighted okay <clears throat> Now, what do we do? We uh, prescribe a trial function u of n given by 4 uh, such that uh, the second part of 4 automatically takes care of the boundary condition and then we uh, uh, try to classify in a sort of a rudimentary way all this uh, collection of methods which I, we uh, can uh, use. <coughs> where actually we satisfy the boundary condition uh, explicitly by the choice of those u or b uh, then uh, we call those methods uh, are the interior methods in contrast uh, you can also have boundary methods where the trial solution is chosen in such a way that uh, it tries to satisfy the initial conditions and governing equations as accurately as possible but uh, does not satisfy the boundary condition okay <coughs> So, boundary methods do not satisfy boundary condition and interior methods satisfy the boundary condition. This is the essential difference. Uh, the third category could be a mixture of the two where the uh, trial solution need not satisfy either the differential equation or the boundary condition. Now, um, if I even if I decide uh, to choose the trial solution in such a way that okay, my intention is to satisfy the differential equation and then I plug it in into the differential equation as given in the right hand side of 6 here. Now, what you would be noticing that even with your best intention that quantity will not be equal to 0 and that is your residue or the solution error that we talked about. So, our uh, equation is basically residue of the equation as obtained with respect to the trial solution that we have chosen. Now, we can actually uh, plug the same expression for our initial condition and you would be even surprised that that also may not be uh, uh, satisfied even with the interior method. So, that is why I said that is a kind of a artificial way of classifying methods because even with your best intention you will find this uh, residues are not going to be equal to 0. Okay? So, that is something we need to uh, uh, keep uh, ourselves uh, cognizant about it. So, we should uh, be careful about it. <clears throat> now, uh, we did not say anything about what this C j of t is going to be. So, what we are going to do is we are trying to find this quantity C j of t by looking at the residue and uh, looking at the residue is not only going to be uh, just uh, looking at it, you have to uh, basically minimize this residue in some sense. Okay? Uh, we need to minimize this residue to some negligible value in some sense and then we try to find out what this function c j of t r. Okay. <clears throat> One of the way of uh, finding this functions c j of t is to select some kind of a weight function. Well, uh, the weighted residual uh, method the sobriquet itself uh, satisfy, I mean, tells you that we are uh, going to talk about some weights. Okay, that is what we are going to do. Let those weighting functions be w j okay. and how many c of j we have? Well, I mean as you have seen uh, we have taken uh, 
uh, n number of uh, such functions in uh, uh, 4. So, what we need to do is we need to derive equations uh, for n number of such equations for uh, evaluating n of these CJs. Okay. <coughs> so, we will uh, choose first step is uh, some weighting functions, what they are, we are going to talk about it shortly, n of them and then we define a sort of a uh, sort of a uh, norm, okay? some kind of a norm of a function v with respect to these weights, which will be defining uh, by this, separated by a comma within a bracket uh, and that is nothing but actually trying to uh, evaluate that quantity over the whole domain uh, with uh, the weight functions multiplied. So, that is what we are going to do. Once we define this norm, then uh, we uh, would like to minimize the equation residual with respect to these weights. That is what this equation 9 is, that is the cardinal principle on which we will be working on this uh, weighted residual method. So, we will uh, basically reduce this uh, equation residue uh, with respect to each and every one of this uh, weight functions w j. Well, whenever you have uh, such a norm equal to 0, that means what? That means that this weights w j s are orthogonal to this uh, solution residue. That is that is the mathematical definition of orthogonality, right. If I have two functions, if they are orthogonal to each other, I can take a product of it and integrate over the whole domain. If they are not correlated, integral should turn out to be 0, right. Correlation means non orthogonality. Orthogonality means non correlation. If two functions are not correlated, the integral of the whole thing should be equal to 0, right. So, here also we are trying to say that look, I will choose uh, my trial solution in such a way that the residue uh, of the equation that I would get uh, should be orthogonal to some particular choice of w j's. Okay? That is what uh, the second point implies here. Now, uh, if my original problem was uh, time independent, then you could uh, notice that uh, we would not be uh, uh, taking c of j as a function of t, that will be a pure constant. Hmm? In a time independent problem, we will just simply write c j of t times u j of x. Okay? And in such a case, uh, uh, equation 9 would give you what? Some kind of a algebraic relation for the c j s, depending on the type of equation that we have, but that they will still be uh, uh, linear algebraic equations right? Uh, for c j s. <coughs> Whereas, if you have a uh, complete space time dependent problem, then uh, the c j s will be of course, a function of uh, time and since you have already prescribed the x dependence and put it into the differential equation and evaluated the residue and then perform this integral with respect to w j. w j s are also functions of x, they are also space dependent functions. So, and you are integrating over the whole domain. So, space dependence part is integrated away, what remains is only the time dependence. So, that is what we are saying that for the space time dependent problem, uh, equation 9 would uh, essentially give you some kind of a ordinary differential equation for this coefficient function c j of t. Okay? So, that is the essential difference between uh, time independent and time dependent problem. In one case, you will get a linear algebraic equation, in the other case, you will get uh, a coupled ODE. <coughs> now, uh, if uh, you have a space time dependent problem, so you are going to have uh, ODE for the CJs, right? So, you would require initial condition for those equations that you get it from your initial residue that we have already defined, right? We have uh, shown here uh, in equation 7 what the initial residue is. So, from here I could uh, get some relationship for C j at t equal to 0. So, that is uh, the essential idea of uh, uh, using that uh, initial residue as well. <coughs> now, uh, as I told you that uh, we will have a ho whole uh, range of weighted residual methods, each one will differ from the other by the type of choice that we uh, exercise uh, in picking up this w j s. Okay? We will we'll talk about it shortly. Okay? However, we must uh, note this uh, after all this uh, thing, 
the trial solutions would not satisfy the governing equations exactly, even for the boundary method. And that is why we are getting this R EQ, R of EQ is uh, non zero, right. So, let us now uh, move uh, over and uh, look at uh, some of the generic uh, classes of methods those are used, ok. Uh, the first uh, such method uh, is the collocation method. Collocation method implies that let us say uh, I have uh, the domain like this and then I have uh, uh, discrete uh, nodes like this and I decide to satisfy this differential equation uh, at uh, discrete points. Those points are called the collocation points. Say for example, I could choose a point here. I could say that this is where I want to set the residue exactly equal to 0. That means what? I am actually performing a, a integration of uh, the weight function with the solution residue, but the weight function itself is a delta function, right. So, that is uh, non zero at x j and everywhere else it is 0. So, that is the essential uh, idea of collocation method, and you can very clearly see this is what you did, uh, we did for finite difference method, right. Is not that what we did? We looked at the differential equation in a discrete form, that is what we call as a difference equation, and we equated them as those nodes, as the finite difference nodes. So, that is equivalent to your collocation method, right. So, that is what we did. However, we could also do something uh, slightly different and which we uh, did not have time to do is we could divide these domains into smaller subdomains, like uh, what I indicated here. If I divide there and I decide to set uh, Wj equal to 1 in that particular subdomain omega j and everywhere else it is uh, 0, that means what? I am integrating the residue in that subdomain, right. Instead of doing it over the whole integral, recall that is what uh, we have defined. So, if I uh, talk about this, so this would uh, imply that I am uh, doing W j uh, times R q and this I am doing it over the whole domain. Now, in the subdomain method, I will just uh, do it only over uh, that particular subdomain there. Then what uh, does it mean? that I am in a sense putting w j equal to 0 everywhere else except that particular subdomain and that is what we have given here in equation 1. Now, this method is what is called as a finite volume method, ok. So, you can see the connection uh, of the uh, uh, FEM with the different methods like uh, as I told you your F D M would be more like your collocation method. Uh, FVM, the finite volume method would be more like your subdomain method, ok. <clears throat> now, uh, this particular method is also called uh, method of integral relations and uh, one of the interesting aspect of it is the following that you see, um, whenever we develop a new subject, we do not start uh, always from scratch, we start with what exists before. For example, when we uh, try to let us say solve uh, uh, computationally problem, what we do in FDM? We actually start off with a differential equation. Well, what does it actually tell you? That it gives you a conservation principles as applied to a single small infinitesimal element. That is your differential equation with the element size uh, vanishing, right. However, when you go to compute, it is, it is not that you are doing in an infinitesimal element, you are doing with a finite size element or domain or whatever you call it. Then what happens? Why should we then take this circuitous route? First derive a differential equation and then again approximate it over a domain and then we satisfy that equation in an integrated sense over a finite domain. So, in uh, finite volume method what is done is this first part is uh, eliminated. What you do is you try to satisfy those conservation principles in those finite domains itself or finite volumes. That is why it is called finite volume method. So, what you do is 
you identify a small element or a small volume and then apply your conservation principle uh, directly to that uh, finite volume or finite element. That is not the same as starting off from a point and then integrating over a domain. Right? Uh, I, I do not know if you appreciate that fact, but this is uh, of, uh, uh, of prime importance that we appreciate uh, what we are doing. It is it's not just a simple, um, I would say, uh, splitting uh, terms just for uh, the sake of it, but this uh, relates to uh, quite a significant difference in uh, the different methods that we get. <clears throat> okay, um, so, now uh, we can see under the umbrella of uh, weighted residual method, we can classify FDM or FVM also as a uh, subcase. Okay. <clears throat> now, in each of these two methods that we just now talked about, you still are trying to get the residue equal to 0 either in a particular point or over a subdomain. Right? That is what the name suggests, whether you are doing collocation or you are doing uh, integral method of integral relation, you are still trying to put the residue equal to 0 exactly at uh, some of those points. However, you just uh, do not want to do that, because you are aware that it is very difficult to make the residue exactly equal to 0. What you could do is, you could accept that there would be some residue, but let us try to minimize that residue. One of the way is uh, minimize the residue in a uh, least square sense. So, what I am going to do is, I will define a functional, which I am calling it i of c. Uh, this is uh, a, some kind of a vector, which is defined in terms of those uh, coefficients, right, in your approximating solutions. Then, what you are saying that um, I will choose this c 1 to c n in such a way, this i of c is minimum. Okay. So, if I do that, what I would need to do is uh, I will just simply uh, differentiate the objective function or the functional i with respect to each of the c j's and that would actually give me this, because your function was uh, r square. So, when I uh, differentiate it with respect to c j, I will get 2 r equivalent times the partial of that r equivalent equation with respect to c j integrated over the full domain and that is equated to 0. So, of course, uh, you can very clearly see uh, from equation 14, uh, if you look at this, this quantity, this partial itself is nothing but your weight function. So, this actually gives you some kind of a basis for choosing the weight function. You choose it in such a way in this method, so that uh, your residue is minimized in a least square sense. Now, this is uh, one way of doing it. Uh, one of the oldest uh, and the classical method is due to Bubnov and Galerkin. This is one of the best known method and it has a few variants also, we will talk about them. In uh, Bubnov Galerkin method, you choose this weight functions uh, as the basis functions that themselves. Okay? So, if you recall what we did, <coughs> we wrote the trial function as this. Well, so, what we are saying now <coughs> that uh, these are what are called as the basis functions. So, in the bubnov galerkin method, we choose the weights themselves as the basis functions. So, w j's are nothing but u j's. Okay. Now, uh, if you uh, try to relate this uh, galerkin method, you can uh, see the necessity for choosing a complete set for this basis function. Why? Uh, because you are trying to obtain um, a trial solution, which could be very arbitrary. And if I am trying to show it as a linear combination of uh, a set of functions, uh, 
uh, it is quite expected that I try to take it as a complete uh, basis functions like what you do in your Fourier series or Legendre polynomial or Bessel functions. You, 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 are, you are familiar with some of those uh, complete uh, sets. Okay? And then what you do is uh, you automatically uh, satisfy what is called as a uniform convergence, because we know that in the limit n going to infinity, I can uh, define any function, any function uh, that, that we can uh, talk about and that uh, is the whole idea of this. <coughs> However, uh, you can see that some of those complete sets of functions that we are just now talked about, they happen to be global functions, right? Like if I take uh, Fourier series, sin cosine functions, they are global functions. You take Legendre's polynomial or Chebyshev functions, all those are global functions. So, uh, they are good, but they are global methods. We are uh, not going to talk about those global methods. So, we will have to probably uh, 